Families, the poet Philip Larkin wrote, they mess you up. Only he used slightly stronger language. When it comes to family business, he was right on the money. A recent survey found only 15% of family businesses survive past the second generation. If the whims of the marketplace don't get you, rivalry or old-fashioned greed will. Which makes the Antonori family of Italy all the more remarkable. As we first reported last fall, they've been in the same line of work for six centuries now. The Antonoris make wine, and the family story reads like a wine review. Complex, stylish, sophisticated, with a bouquet both elegant and earthy. It's harvest time in the great vineyards of Italy, none greater than the 5,000 acres farmed by the Antonori family. Until recently, Italian business, especially the wine business, was pretty much for men only. Girls normally in families like ours ended up to be married possibly happily, and that's it, no, no need to work. But Albiera Antonori and her two sisters are the first women in 26 generations to play a major role in the family enterprise. Allegra Antonori. I feel part of the land, you know. I think I, uh, I'm owned by that land. It's something very, very strong. From the fields to the cellars, you'll find the Antonori women at work, hoping, as vintners have for centuries, that this year, the balance of sun, soil, and rain will produce a vintage for the ages. Alessia Antonori. People use these wonderful words to describe taste. There's personality. What else? The elegance. <laughs> the elegance. wine has to be elegant. <laughs> and so you say, how do you describe elegance? You can't. It's like an elegant woman. How do you describe her? It's, uh, it's personal. You know it when you see exactly, it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Their domain stretches from the legendary vineyards of Tuscany and Umbria to their property in California's Napa Valley. Antonori is perhaps the oldest family business on earth. The first document which uh, we have which proves that an ancestor of mine was involved in the wine production dates back to 1385. The patriarch and still the godfather is Piero Antonori. He's 70 and bears the noble title of Marchesa. He works behind an antique desk that dates to the Renaissance. When we have to take some decision regarding the family, we have them here. And my father used to do the same thing. And in his birthplace, Florence, the city that gave birth to the Renaissance, that flowering of art, science, and the good life, he leads a visitor to a small window to the past. It looks like a confessional. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds of years ago, an Antonori cellar master sat waiting for customers to knock. The cellar master would uh, pass a bottle of, uh, of Chianti wine and uh, he would receive the money back. This has been in operation until a couple of centuries ago. Recent history by your standard. Yes, we did. For 623 years, various Antonori have kept the business going despite war, plague, political intrigue, and the shifting tastes of consumers. The family tree shows a bumper crop of Antonori who made their mark, not just in wine, but in every aspect of Italian life in business, in politics, in church. So the family always made sure back then that the, all bets were covered, correct? <laughs> I think it was a bit the concept, yes. <laughs> yes. There were poets and priests, rogues and rascals. In 1576, Francesco de' Medici, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, had won Antinori strangled for his undue attentions to Bianca, the Duke's wife. In the 1700s, another Antinori cultivated Pope Clement XII as an important customer. The pontiff, who commissioned the building of Rome's Trevi Fountain, decided to throw a few coins the Antinori's way. We have some correspondence saying that the Pope used to like very much the wines of our family and he wanted to order more. A pretty good recommendation, correct? <laughs> Especially in the 18th century. Yes, no doubt. But the family history lining the shelves of the Marquesa's office, 
says precious little about the wives and daughters in the Antonari family tree, a fact not lost on Albiera, Allegra, and Alessia. Are there any interesting women in those 26 generations? I'm sure there are some women, but women in history in the past time, even if, unless they were yeah. special, they were not considered, really considered yes, exactly. to be mentioned. It's true because when I went to agricultural university in northern Italy, in Milan, we were two women, and the rest were all men, very lucky. For six centuries, command of the Antonori Empire was passed from father to son. But with no male heir, the Marchesa, some years ago, sold a major stake in the business to Whitbread, a British company whose fortune was based on beer making. It was the period when I didn't know exactly if my daughters uh, would be interested or not uh, to be involved in the business. And so for me, that was a way to guarantee a continuity also to the company. But the partnership produced mainly grapes of wrath. It was a vintage clash between the foaming suds of quick profits and Piero insisting he'd sell no wine before its time. This marriage of inconvenience ended when Piero bought back the shares, keeping Antonori all in the family. I think he saw us interested and said, why not? What's wrong with girls? And so took his chance, expecting his daughters to, to, to fall him. in love with the business. And that they did. Now all three travel the countryside and the world, helping to grow, promote, and market Antonori wines. They sold 17 million bottles last year, $200 million worth, making a healthy profit. And though the business now involves spreadsheets and science, the basics still come, as they have for centuries, from down on the farm. Even with all this tradition and history and everything else, the family still regards itself as, as farmers, yes? Yes, absolutely. This is our origin still now. In modern times, we are basically, basically farmers. We appreciate the nature and the countryside more than the glamorous uh, city life. Your three so, country bumpkins. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, hardly. Salute. Cheers. Elegance is the rule at Palazzo Antonori, the family home in Florence. Since the family's wines must be sampled often to ensure quality control, every lunch at the Palazzo is a kind of business lunch. The Marchesa, his wife Francesca, their daughters and sons-in-law, and the grandchildren all may have a say. Any family arguments at this table? <laughs> Come on, secrets. I want secrets revealed here. Yes. Sometimes we start with an argument, but after three or four glasses of wine... <laughs> Everything then. disappears. <laughs> this palazzo has been in the family since 1506, both the headquarter of the business and also the residence of the family. When an Antonori wishes to seek solace, or a place for quiet contemplation, or even a place to confess his earthly sins, it's hardly difficult. Just leave the Palazzo Antonori, and traffic notwithstanding, cross the Piazza Antonori, and within minutes arrive at the Capella Antonori, the Antonori family chapel, where they might visit the tomb of Alessandro Antonori one of the founders of the dynasty, and perhaps a nod to any number of Antonori's buried beneath the chapel floor. If wealth and history can buy you one lasting pleasure, it is convenience. Marchese Antonori, for instance, commutes by air to his most famous vineyard, Tignanello, in the Tuscan countryside south of Florence. Here, the family developed the red wines for which they're famous. At his villa here, this is the view the Marchesa wakes up to every morning. We have the vineyards the and the landscape. But as the experience with the British partners showed, it's no business for the impatient or for those who have a taste for the quick buck. Ten years can pass from the time a new vine is planted until its wine comes to market. You have to be patient and to wait until the wine is good enough, the vines are old enough to produce a good wine. But it's not all dirt and business. 
there's that other estate, Guado El Tasso, on the Tuscan coast. I did my own stable, my own uh, training track uh, in the middle of the vineyards. I go riding there every morning. It's beautiful. I love it. It's a very good life you described. You, uh, are you spoiled? Yes, I am very <laughs> spoiled. But I think we appreciate what we have. And they are constantly reminded that in this line of work, nature always has the last word. The Antonori found the 2002 crop wasn't up to par and didn't bother bottling most of it. You cannot force things, you cannot force nature. If you have a bad vintage, <laughs> tough luck. We can wake it up for a second before <laughs> we put it back to sleep. Every few months, they check on the progress of their wine, fast asleep in the cellars. <laughs> The verdict, let it sleep a while longer. You see it's still very young, very rough, very, has to stay in there for, for a little while. Another family meal, another bottle of wine or two. Every once in a while, someone offers to buy them out, but this farmer and his daughters politely decline. On the theory that if family ownership was good enough in 1385, it's good enough today. It is really our intention to remain a family business because we think that this is the best solution for us. For at least another 500 years. <laughs> at least. <laughs>